Anyway, this passage of Scripture, there's, three, there's two other places that we'll look at tonight. We're going to kind of go back and forth and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other place is Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. And the other place is Luke 21, verses 25 to 36. We're not going to them right now, but we will be going in a few moments here. Um, so, as I mentioned last week, if you were with us last Wednesday night... The Bible is very clear here in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately. So this, what is, what is, is being taking place is the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation. As we know, we looked at this. We won't look at it again tonight. I read it again last week. I even kind of gave you a preview, and you've heard me repeat this verse. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21, talk about... Christ coming back on a horse, amen. We're following him on horses, amen. Praise God from heaven. How about that? Real horses from heaven. You know, Christ right now in heaven is in a body of flesh and bone. Did you know that? He's not in a spirit body. Remember what I shared with you last week and, you know, different messages here recently? They questioned him in Luke 24. Hey, they thought they'd seen a, a ghost, a spirit. Oh, it must be a spirit. No, Jesus said, does a spirit have flesh and bone? Jesus said in this glorified state he was, had, had flesh and bone. He went up, he rose up physically, he ascended up physically. As I mentioned last week, he's returning back at the Mount of Olives someday. Zechariah talks about that. Amen? That's where he's coming down. He'll be coming back. Amen? Well, I'll tell you, looking forward, looking forward to that. So we'll look at these different passages in a few minutes here, and we'll look at, uh, uh, again, Mark 13 and Luke 21. But let's continue on. So verse 21, uh, verse 29, okay? What happens here immediately follows the tribulation. When you do the study on the book of Revelation, you'll find pretty much most of it is chronological. As a matter of fact, as we'll see tonight, when you get down to the vials, some call them bulls, that last judgment, again, it, it, it mentions some things that we're going to look at in verse 29 about the sun and the stars and the shaking of the earth. I mean, it's, it's, things are going to be happening. Can you imagine? 21 judgments fall down on this earth, and it's, this whole place, this whole planet is going to be shaken. Uh, it's going to be pretty, 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 pretty wild. I can't imagine what it's going to be like. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm not going to be here. Amen? So and look, look at Revelation 16. Revelation 16. Let's look at that for a minute. See what we can cover. We might have to do two parts on this one. But anyway, Revelation 16, Revelation 16. Again, you, you have the seal judgments. You've got 21 judgments in total. You've got the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and then you've got the vials, okay? And when you go to Revelation chapter 16, the first vial, of course, is in verse 2. The second, uh, um, the second vial is verse 3. The third vial is verses 4 through 7. The fourth vial is verses 8 and 9. Verse 10 is the fifth vial. Verse 12 is the sixth vial. And then there's a little bit of a parentheses there, verses 13 to 16 there. And then what you have after that is the seventh vial. And he says here, watch this. And the seventh, verse 17, angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since uh, men were upon the earth. Remember what we read earlier in our study in Matthew 24, the events that take place that were described in chapter 24 of Matthew, and also Mark 13 and Luke 21. He says, there's never been a time like this on planet earth. There never has been. Amen? You think, oh, you know, we've had earthquake. Yes, we have, but not like you're going to have in this, this time called the tribulation, okay? It's not going to be the same. And he says here, um, that men upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great, verse 19, and the great city was divided into three parts, cities of the nations fell, great Babylon came, remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of the wrath, and every island fled away, the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, that men blaspheming God because of the plague of hail. you think people would be crying out to God, God, help us, God, we believe you. No, they're... They, Man, I'll tell you, you know, they're blaspheming God. You think, you know, but people going through stuff like this, they would turn to God. The Bible says they're not, amen? These people are not. They're blaspheming God, for the plague was great, verse 21. Amen? So 
This is what takes place. This is what we're, the, the, the time frame that we're in here, okay? The time frame that we're in here in this chapter of Matthew 24 is about the same place. And then, again, there's a couple of chapters left. And again, there's a, things about Babylon and so forth. Um, and then you get down to chapter 19, then we got the marriage of the Lamb, then the second coming of Christ, which we've already read, like I said last week, Revelation 19, verses 11, right down to about, uh, I guess, verse 16 there, and uh, so, or right down to the end, actually. So that's when Christ comes back, and in, in, in especially the verses 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, amen, the second coming of Christ. So this is the context of the Matthew 24, 29 passage, okay? So he says immediately, immediately. Now, interesting, go to Luke chapter 21. Here's the comparative passage. It doesn't use the word immediately because there's something else in Luke's gospel that doesn't appear in Matthew and Mark's gospel. If you've been with us over the last months or the last couple of months, I don't know how long we've been in this chapter. We've been in this chapter for a while, amen? This is the Olivet Discourse. And like I told you last week and the week before, I've never studied more the Olivet Discourse than I have during this study. This has been the most in-depth study I've ever done personally in the Olivet Discourse. I've read it, I've studied it, but not to this degree. And uh, so back in Matthew, uh, or back in, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 21, you're there waiting on me, Luke chapter 21, you have uh, some similarities, but you got differences. And the big difference in Luke chapter 21, it actually prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. This is the only place in the, in the Gospels that describe this. And that's verses 20 to 24. Okay, at least 20 to 24 to the first part of that verse, okay? And uh, then, verse 25, all of a sudden, verse 20, and then there should be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's the same as what we just read in Matthew 24, 29, okay? So, again, I'm not going to get in on this, but you've got to remember, there are people out there, I don't think there's a large percent of them uh, that I'm aware of, um, but there are some out there who are called preterists. They believe, they spiritualize a lot of stuff in Revelation. They say, oh, we're just, this is spiritually, and it, it they, they, they have to spiritualize because they say it all happened during uh, when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. That's why they say that. No, this is yet future, um, all these events, and the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and the earth shaking. That's future. That hasn't happened yet. That's going to happen. But what did happen was what the Apostle Luke put in there in his gospel. Again, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, verses 20 to 24. And so what you also know, there's a phrase at the end of verse 24, and he says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. And this is, again, speaking of God's people, um, you know, the, the people that died during that siege. If you do anything, study, uh, I have a thing. I have, you know, I got this volume that someone gave me uh, of Josephus. And he talks about this. He talks about the siege of Jerusalem at that time. It was just absolutely terrible, absolutely terrible. And he says, they'll be led away captive into all nations. So God's people were scattered. The records were destroyed. They were destroyed. The only record that's not been destroyed is this record right here. The Word of God, which gives us the genealogy of through jo uh, Christ, through Joseph, his stepfather, and through his mother in the Gospel of Luke. We have the genealogy. Christ is, is going to be on his throne someday. Amen? But no Jew has a genealogy as far as beyond, but before this time. They don't have any records beyond this time because they were destroyed at this time. And when that took place there, and he says, the led away captive into all nations. So God's people were dispersed. As a matter of fact, when you, uh, when you, when you read the book of Hebrews in the beginning, I try, uh, uh, can't get, give you, I want to give you the right words here. In the book of Hebrews, uh, let's see here, in verse chapter 1, if I can get there here. Or actually, no, I'm sorry, James, that's it, James. I'm trying to think here. Remember all these places here. James chapter 1, he says, And James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. They're scattered. After this, they're scattered They've been this way for thousands, 2,000 years. How about that? All the Jews are not. There's a lot of them in South America. 
There's a lot of them in South America. There's a lot of them in Mexico. They're, they're scattered everywhere. They're scattered everywhere. They're not all back home. They will come home. And they will come home at the beginning of that tribulation. The Lord, as you've been with us over the weeks, uh, God's going to make them go home. <laughs> He's going to make them come back to their land. Um, and uh, so anyway, and he says here, uh, uh, and, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the gen times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So what's happening is this. What will happen is that the times of the Gentiles will be when we're, that will be fulfilled when we're taken out of here. And then God is going to resume his program with his earthly physical people, the uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to do that. The nation of Israel, he's going to resume that. As my wife and I were talking, they're going to have temple worship. They're going to be doing their sacrifices again. They're going to have that rebuilt. Supposedly they got the parts of the, the Holy of Holies. Supposedly some of that stuff is made already or hidden or whatever. I don't know. You know but that stuff is going to resume when we're taken out of here. And as you already know, when we talked about the other part in the, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, in Matthew there, the abomination of desolation in the middle of that seven-year period. So watch this. So then he says there, so what happens is, <clears throat> and there shall be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, verse 25, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, Luke's gospel is not only different in the sense that it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, which is very unique in the gospels, but it also gives the feelings of the people and what they're going through, which is unique in the gospel of Luke. Just think of this. Remember who Luke was. What was he? A doctor. It mentions some things that are so unique. For instance, only Luke's gospel talks about the drops of blood when Christ was in the garden praying. It, it, it's very unique. He has all of that. Amen. He talks about these things, some of the descriptive matters of health and so forth. Now watch this. And he says this, and you think, you know, um, so there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations. You think there's dress, distress of nations tonight. Nothing like what's going to happen. With, per, with per, perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Watch this. We've already preached on this a while ago. I used this in one of my messages on fear. Men's hearts failing them for fear. That's what we're dealing with in our world right now. But this is going to be so much worse. <laughs> so much worse. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Listen, this whole thing's going to be shaken. The Bible tells us, as I read so many times, Romans 8, the Bible says it, the earth is groaning and travailing. The Bible says we're groaning and travailing. We're waiting for the redemption of our body. That hasn't happened yet, amen? You know, as we yield to the Holy Spirit of God, we live for Christ, you know what? We're going to walk in accordance with the Lord and walk in accordance with, with the, the Scriptures, amen, as we yield to Him. But if we yield to the flesh, we'll be after the flesh, amen? And so, but, uh, you know, this body is not redeemed. That's your, that's your greatest battle, the flesh, the flesh, amen? We got to put it down. Paul says, I put my body under, Amen? That's what we got to do as believers every day. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. He didn't say he physically died. No, he's got to put down that flesh every day. He woke up. He said, God, help me with this. God, I've struggled with this. Romans 7 talks about the struggle. That great tongue twister. Amen? He wanted to do the right thing, and he couldn't do it, and he wanted to do it. And, you know, he just struggled, struggled back and forth. And you and I face the same struggles if you're honest with yourself. You, you do. We all do. Amen. None of us are exempt from this. We all face the flesh. It hits us everywhere you go. And of course, since we're all connected in different ways and, you know, through media, advertising, advertising, you know, have you ever noticed that you go on the internet, something, you look at something, you go on Amazon and just look at some items and all of a sudden, bang, this page, this sidebar of, of Facebook and this one of Twitter and this one in Chrome and this one in Firefox, this one in, in Microsoft Edge, they're throwing all these things at you because they got you figured out. It's all the, you're, you got the cookie crumbs everywhere, hey, man, cookies. You left some cookies, you left some crumbs there and they say, hey, this, this person likes that, so we're going to give you more. So you got to be careful. What are you watching on there? You're going to get more of that thrown at you. Are you careful what you're watching? 
Amen? You say, you, you read a lot of this, it's going to get more and more and more and more. It's going to keep on increasing. Amen? So you got to be careful. You know, I, I looked at some photography, and next thing you know, I'm getting this, 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 same thing, same thing, over and over again. I said, okay, I got the picture, okay. Anyway, yeah, pardon the pun. Anyway, <laughs> amen? So anyway, so, you know, so men's hearts failing for fear, amen? The powers of heaven shaken. Then, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. See, there is a gap between verse 24, at the end of verse 24, and verse 25, when Christ comes back there. At the end of the time of the Gentiles, times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. But again, the preterist will say, no, no, there isn't. Christ came back. Really? He already came back in spirit. Oh, okay. That's what the Jehovah Witnesses preach, by the way. They preach that. He came back in 1918 in spirit. <laughs> That's what they preach. There he is. Okay. I, I don't know if I want to be identifying with the Jehovah Witnesses who deny the deity of Christ, the Trinity. Amen. I'm telling you. And they, they believe Jesus died at the stake. He was tortured at the stake. We were just talking about that earlier today, too. You know, their translation, New World Translation, made so many changes. There's not a manuscript around that can, ver that can you can attest, you can correlate to, that identifies how all the changes they've made. You know, they just made up some of their own things. Amen. I guess if you want to do that, you can do that. But you can lead people astray, too, unless they think and try to study, look into these things. So anyway, and then he says there, many shall see, and then shall they see the Son of Man, verse 27, coming in a crowd with, uh, with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come past, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So anyway, so anyway, there's a lot. And when you get to Matthew's gospel, when we finish the Olivet Discourse, you, or all the stuff about prophecy and the tribulation, it, all of a sudden you've got the parable of the fig tree. And we'll be covering that down the road here. So we've got more verses and more things to look at. Amen? Now look at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. You can see the similarity in Mark 13 to the gospel of Matthew chapter 24. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. <clears throat> In Mark chapter 13, let's see here. Um, let's go down here. And um, verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation... Again, similar to what we read in Matthew 24, where he says there immediately after the tribulation of those days. And again, uh, Luke's gospel has this preceding the part about the destruction of Jerusalem, and then he leads into something event future. Here in Mark's gospel is very close to the gospel of Matthew. And uh, so he says, after that tribulation, sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall he see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels to gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Then you get into the fig tree again, all about the fig tree. And again, if you go to Matthew 24, Look what happens at the end. Isn't that right? We already read that th tonight. Look at verse 32 of Matthew 20 about the fig tree. There you go. It gets right into that. Amen. So they're similar in some respects, but different in other respects. Okay? So let's look at some of these things here. If I can just kind of skip through here. Um, about this, all of these things here in uh, verse uh, 29. He says, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the powers of the heavens. How about that? Amen? The sun, the moon, the, all those things. Now, interesting, we're going to look at some passages here. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. I think we'll look at uh, we'll look at Joel, the book of Joel. Amen? Book of Joel, good old Joel. Amen. Joel, Joel, chapter, let's see here, 2. Joel chapter 2. And so what you have here in the book of Joel, prophet Joel here, again, events um, preceding the second advent. When I say the second advent, I don't mean the rapture. I mean the revelation. I mean at the end of the tribulation because there's two parts of that second coming. One is to take his bride out 
so that we are, we are, listen, praise God, the church, the bride of Christ, will not be here during the tribulation. We are going to be free from the wrath of God. Praise God for that. Amen. Boy, th thank the Lord for that. And uh, so then, and then, of course, at the end of that tribulation, while we're with the Lord, the marriage, the, and then the, the judgment seat, all of that, and then we're coming back for the marriage supper of the Lamb, thousand-year reign of Christ, and all of that. And he says here, verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth and blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And so come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name or call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, in and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Amen. Boy, I tell you, there'll be a remnant of God's people saved. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Remember, we talked about the little wilderness uh, trip or journey that the God's people have in that tribulation time. Just somewhat similar to some respects. Amen. And um, so anyway, watch this here. Let's see. I think it's chapter 3, chapter 3. And uh, let's see here. The day of the Lord here. There's so many things here. Um, uh, let's see here. I think I will go down to... Uh, let's hear it. Put uh, verse 14. Again, some of this has to do with the battle of Armageddon because if you read this here, verse 14, multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. You know, you can spiritualize that and you say a lot of people are making decisions today. Amen? Or you can talk about that spiritually. But chronologically uh, and doctrinally, it's, gonna, it's, it, it's referring to the battle of Armageddon. Amen. That's what it's referring to. Watch this. Verse 15. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. How about that? The Lord shall roar out of Zion. Amen. The lion, the tribe of Judah. How about that? He's going to roar. wonder if that sounds going to utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. See that there in verse 16? But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And he should be your hope and your strength tonight. Amen? Is he your hope and strength? He's our hope for salvation, but he's our hope also from day to day. He needs our strength from day to day. Amen? And again, we've kind of went through all those kind of studies and, you know, having a victorious Christian life. Amen? God doesn't want you to be defeated. Amen? And then, of course, it leads into the kingdom and so forth, the thousand-year reign of Christ, all of that. So, again, some of these prophetic passages go to uh, Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. And, again, some things in the Old Testament. So, I don't like the Old Testament. You know, I, I don't, can't make heads or tails of it. I'll tell you something you need to read because what you find is that Christ quotes the Old Testament the, 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 uh, the epistles in the New Testament, many of them quote the Old Testament. <laughs> Amen. They do. As a matter of fact, that verse um, that we read, I think, in Haggai, I think, or no, in Joel, I read, that's right, I haven't gone to Haggai yet, but we'll be there. But Isaiah chapter 13, but some of them are quoted only one time, and then some are quoted repeatedly. So Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13, and again, here's about the great tribulation, uh, let's see here. The day of the Lord, that's a, whole, that's a whole message in itself, just talking about the day of the Lord, verse 6. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore all, shall all hands be faint, every man's heart shall melt. That sounds like Luke, amen? That's what it's talking about, hearts fainting for fear. That's what's going to happen. You say, man, some of this stuff's scary, you know, in our world today. Oh, I'm glad I'm saved. Boy, I tell you, I'm glad I'm saved. Thank the Lord for that. People will be full. You think people are full of fear tonight in our world? Oh, boy, they don't get saved. They'll be full of fear. They will be full of fear. Amen. Verse 8, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travailed. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the star, here it is, again, Matthew 24, 29. Here we go. For the stars of heaven, the constellations thereof, shall not give their light. 
The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, amen, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And I will lay the haughtiness of the terrible. You say, that is so terrible, God doing that. Remember, the people that entered tribulation didn't want God to begin with. They didn't believe in Christ. They did not. So I'll, I, you know, I'll, get, I'll get saved in the tribulation. Really? Really? And you don't, you don't understand the tribulation. You don't understand it all. God says over there in that Second Thessalonians passage that I've repeated so many times, I can't count, that he will send a strong delusion. So why would God do that? Because they don't want God. God will give people what they want. They don't want them, they, he's not going to get them. That's what people want. Now, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Bible. Okay. You know what? I, I, I beg and plead with people when I'm talking about Christ and salvation. But I, I'm not going to get them to ramble a prayer they don't believe in. I'm not going to give them a rote prayer and say, oh, come on, pray this prayer and you'll, you'll be going to heaven. No, if you don't believe in your heart, you're not saved. The Bible says, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You've got to believe with your heart. Amen? You mean it? You understand it? What Christ did? You want him? Amen? You want to go to hell? Well, I don't believe in heaven. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It's real. It's more real than you can ever imagine. Amen? People got a lot of imaginations in this world tonight. They fail to realize that this is reality, what we're talking about. They think, oh, this is just a fairy tale that you guys are all gathered together tonight, you know, and this is a big crutch. You all need a crutch tonight because you're so weak. That's how the world looks at you and I as Christians. Hey, listen, thank God, man. I'll tell you. Hey, man, praise the Lord. Yeah, I need him. You got that right. I need the Lord. I need him all the time. Amen. I need him every day. I like the songwriter that wrote, I need thee every hour. Amen? Do you need him every hour? wonder how many of us sang that song, and we really don't. How, how long does it go before you, how many hours can go by before you say, you think in your heart, I really need the Lord? We get so busy in our lifestyles and our things that are going on. We so get so connected, watching stuff, looking at stuff, not saying wicked stuff either, not necessarily. And then we kind of, do you really need the Lord? You, have you forgotten about I need him every hour. Amen? I need him. I hope you realize that. You need him every hour. God says he's going to punish the world for their evil. He's not going to punish the church. <laughs> Amen? It's Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. It's not the church's trouble. This time that these people are going through is, is Jacob's trouble, a seven-year for a time frame on this earth, God's taken the church, his bride, out. He's not going to beat up his bride. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, people got this all messed up. Amen. Look at this, verse 12. Here's the Jewish remnant. Again, the great tribulation. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, therefore, you see that? I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord a host, and in the day of his fierce anger. Wow. And it shall be as he chased the roll, and the sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone to his own land. And I'll tell you, what a, what a time. What a time. Oh, I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I'm saved. Amen. So you kind of see Old Testament passages here. I'm just skimming through my notes here. Amen. Good thing I'm not doing everything in here. Um, yeah, we already covered Luke 21. I'm just going by memory here anyway. Let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so why don't we go through some of these things individually? And again, the darkening of the sun. Again, a preterist, a lot of the preterists say, oh, it's just spiritual, it's symbolic, it's symbolic, it's symbolic. No, it's the real sun. Yeah, the sun can be used in, in, a, in a symbolic sense. Amen? Like, for instance, the Lord is a sun and a shield. Amen? That's used in a symbolic sense, but that's just a handful of times. There's about 164 times in the Bible where the word sun is mentioned, and about five of them are, can be implied or thought of as symbolic, but the rest of them are a real sun. The real sun that you see up in the sky. <laughs> it is real, amen. Did you, did you feel that? You know, I, I, where I live there in, in Lower Sackville, um, I get the afternoon sun. And uh, 
I, I don't need the heat on in the afternoon when I get the afternoon sun. It could be pretty cold, but I don't really need the heat on much at all because I got these two, these three windows, a big uh, window in the middle and two side windows, and it just like a, it's like a magnifying lens kind of accentuating that heat in the living room. And it gets warm. In the summer, it gets really hot. Amen. And uh, so the sun, yeah, it's real. It's right. Amen. You can feel it. Amen. I really enjoyed the sun on Saturday. Amen. Wasn't that a beautiful day? Friday and Saturday of last week. And then all of a sudden we got the storm again, more of this stuff. But anyway, praise the Lord. It's all good. Amen. Um, so the sun. So again, some of these, these people who don't believe and take this literally they say, well, you know, it's symbolic and all that. Yeah, really. Yeah, they just don't want to believe. You don't want to believe. You don't want to believe at all. And uh, so anyway, yeah, we covered Isaiah 13. We've covered that. I'm just skimming through here. Yeah, verse 10, we covered that. Next page. Amen. Just going through this thing here. So again, let's go back to Matthew 24, 29. Amen. I'm caught up. I'm caught up. How about that? Matthew 24, 29. So in there, I mentioned you when I was reading the passage, there's four things mentioned. We'll cover that a little bit more in detail, okay? First of all, you'll see that the sun is darkened. Verse, that's the first thing. Immediately after the tribulation of the days, the sun be, shall the sun be darkened. That's the first thing. Number two, at this time, this is at the end of the tribulation. Can you imagine? Um, the sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not give her light. Now, when you, when you look at this, you got to understand, you know, people think, you know, unless they've, you know, been through school or something, the little kids may think, oh, the sun or the moon, look at that light. It gives the light. No, it reflects light. That's what it's doing. The moon reflects light. Where? Because the sun has set somewhere, okay? It's set, and then it, it, the moon is at a different phase, and you can see more or less of the moon. You got the waxing and waning of the moon, and it's just the way our earth is rotating, and it's, it's doing a lot of things. Amen. Can you imagine? Aren't you glad God put this thing in motion, and he's keeping it in motion? Everything. Would, can you imagine if all the planets start crashing, and the moon, all this stuff? You know, God did it. I remember there was someone who did a model. I don't know if it was a couple hundred years ago or something. Someone did a model. I can't remember who the guy was. Maybe some of you correct me on this, and this person was dealing with an unsaved person. The guy was a a Christian, he explained how he put all this thing together and this thing's turning around and all of this and these like gears and all these little things are turning around doing all these things. And the guy would say, man, amazed. He says, and the guy said this in so many words. He says, well, uh, it just happened to come together just like that. He said, no, it did not. He's trying to get a point across. Look at our, look at our universe. Look at the planets. They're all in motion. They all have certain things. And if evolution was true, how come there's, which one is it that's spinning the, the opposite direction that it's supposed to be spinning? You got all these different things going on. God did the thing. God put it in motion. It didn't come, to, come together by random chance. There's order. There's design in our universe. Amen. People, can you imagine life come from non-life? That's what evolution teaches. Life comes from non-life. How about that? No, life comes from life, God. He gave life. He created man from the dust of the ground. Amen? He became a living soul. Hey, Brother Don, you talked about that Sunday morning. Man and woman, made in the image of God. How about that? Amen? No, there's, we're not an we're not, we're not accident of evolution. That's why people have no regard for life. They put human beings on the same plane as animals. That's why the status of animals, listen, I, that's not a statement for mistreating of animals. You read your Bible, the Bible says the Old Testament law was to regard the life of your beast. God talks about the birds and all, all these, the sheep and all. He says, you're more value of them. God elevated. God put men in dominion over his creation. Amen. And this, listen, again, we're not mistreating anything, any animals. But let me tell you something. They don't have a soul. They don't have a soul. We do. God made us in his image, not the animals. Amen. So, but we've come to a point where people have elevated the animal kingdom and they devalued human life at birth and in those golden years. 
That's what that's what our society is at. You know, let's 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 you know, eugenics, that's what it is. That's Margaret Sangster. Planned Parenthood. That's what that all that stuff is. Eugenics. That's all it is. You know, just destroy life. Oh, they're 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 taking up space. That's what that is. That's eugenics. Racist stuff. That's what you what Darwin was a racist. Read his books. People would purport that in our society that's so inclusive and diverse and, and all of that? I can't believe that. It's hard for me to even imagine that they would even promote Darwin in this so-called woke generation of people. Really, it's pretty sad. It's pretty pathetic. Why would you even promote that? You don't want to read the second book of Darwin. <laughs> Especially for the black race, it's terrible. Boy, well, I tell you, it goes through a lot of descriptions in there. Don, you've read it? I don't know. I've, I've read through it. I've highlighted sections of it. It's terrible. You know what? God made everybody, regardless of skin color, in his image. Darwin taught that the black race was the intermediate species between monkeys and the white race. Why would you even want to teach that in the public system? That's blasphemy. You're a human being. God made everyone in his image. It's terrible out there. And that's what they're teaching the kids. You're just an animal. You're just, you're just an accident of evolution, of random chances. Impossible. Impossible. There's things that have to operate and, and, and come into existence at the same time for this body to work properly. And if it didn't happen, you wouldn't be alive. That's the same with all the animal kingdom. I'll tell you, this people, they don't, you know what? We just don't want to study and read. We don't want to study and read. Anyway, so in Matthew chapter 24, 29, so we saw there's the sun, the moon, the stars, and the powers of heaven that are going to be shaken. Amen. So again, another interpretation is not literal, and they say it's poetic. This is all poetic. <laughs> I'm serious. You read these books, you read these things, this is all poetic, you know, it's just, that's all, it's a Hebrew poetic form, when you read that stuff in the old, a Hebrew poetic form. Yes, there's some things that are used in a symbolic state. We've already talked about that. But not this, not this event. This is not symbolic. This is physical. This is going to happen someday. Thank God for that. Amen. So what he says here again, he says, what, what, number one, we've already looked at the sun. The sun is darkened. Amen. Then he says, the, no moonlight. So we're talking about the moon. And it's interesting because I like the analogy. The sun is like a picture, amen, of, of God in a sense. Amen. It's a picture of Christ, amen? It's a picture of God and Christ. He's the light. As a matter of fact, I like that passage in the book of Revelation that Christ will be the light of that heavenly place. And, and the implication of that is without Christ, heaven would be eternal darkness. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, see, you wouldn't see the beauty of, of, of heaven. You know, people say, well, I can't wait for the streets of... Uh, streets of gold and the gates of pearl and talk about all this stuff. That's from the physical, earthly viewpoint. The main focus point will be Christ. Amen. The streets, listen, are solid gold. <laughs> Amen. But you wouldn't be able to see those things unless Christ was the light of that place. He's the light of that place. So the sun is like a picture of God and Christ, okay? And then the moon, really, is supposed to be a picture of you and I reflecting the light of Christ to the earth, this world that we live in. That's, listen, this world needs the light of Jesus Christ more than ever. They're in desperate need of that. That's the greatest need of the world, Christ, Christ, salvation in Christ. That's what this world needs. 
You know, I, I, pray, I pray people will open their eyes to the gospel more than any other subject, more than any other topic that's being discussed on social media. Like I said on Sunday, Sunday last week, you can get your rights and freedoms here, but if you're not saved, you're going straight to hell. You're ending up in a place called hell. Okay, you get some temporary relief here. And maybe life may be, you know, somewhat pleasant, I guess you can say. You know, that, that's not a statement against rights and freedoms. I'm just saying, earthly perspective, if you, you don't, listen, if you believe life's done and you don't believe in heaven or hell, you, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, and I want to live comfortably here. Amen. Nobody wants to die of any disease or cancer or COVID or anything. Of course not. Amen. But there is life after death. You have an eternal soul. And it goes on forever. And people in this world need Jesus Christ. They need Jesus Christ. So again, that moon, that moon um, is mentioned in there. And then watch this, the stars. Look at that next one there, amen? The stars shall fall from heaven. The stars will fall from heaven. Can you imagine that? This is an all in preparation for Christ coming back. All these, these natural events taking place, the world's just crashing, to, coming to pieces. Amen? The, the, the stars, the constellations, the, the moon, the, the sun, all of this. The, the God who spoke it into existence is, is, is winding the whole thing down. This is what's going to happen at the end of the tribulation time. Wow. Stars falling. Amen? Can you imagine that? Stars falling. He says, Stars that shall fall from heaven. You say, what, what's that? I don't know. Maybe uh, asteroids, uh, meteorites, comets. You know, well, oh, we're so close. That asteroid just missed us. Oh, that comet. You know, one of these days it might hit us. Well, I'll tell you something. Something's going to be falling down to heaven, from heaven to earth. You know, you know how the evolution is. Well, say, like, you know, there was an asteroid bombarded the earth and all that. At the end of the tribulation, something's going to be bombarding the earth. The Bible says it'll fall from heaven. You think, listen, you, you look at the moon. How do you think those were created? I know God created them, but you know what? Things hit the, hit the earth. Look at some of the craters on this earth where some meteorites hit. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. Oh, oh. That's something else. You know, shooting stars. The kids say, well, they're shooting star. Make a wish. One day they won't be saying that. They won't be. They won't be. They'll be coming down on this earth. Is that one going to hit? Yeah, it's coming. Aren't you glad you won't be here? Amen. Let's see. What else here? So Matthew 24, 29 talks about a complete blackout of the sun, the moon, and the stars followed by the second coming. A total blackout. Can you imagine that? Okay? So with all of that in mind, where's my other reference here? That's again, as I repeat, and I got to stop right there. We got to stop and we'll break for prayer here. Um, let's see here. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9. We read this. I need to just read it again. You say, wow. So... Just to remind you, these things are all connected that I'm sharing with you. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. Verse 8, actually verse uh, 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. <laughs> See, they thought they missed the the return of Christ. They thought they'd missed the, the rapture, so to speak, that which was talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. They thought, oh, we missed it. We're going through all this trouble. We must, we're not, must be now in da da uh, Daniel's 70th week, yeah, you know, uh, Jacob's trouble. No, you're not. Sometimes you might feel like that in your life, in our society, in our governments, in our land, in our countries, in different places. Just think about what the Christians have went through the last hundred years in China. I guarantee a lot of them thought, man, that mousy tongue must be the Antichrist. I guarantee you. All, every one of these dictators down through the ages, they must have thought, oh, that one's the Antichrist. 
Study some literature. A lot of them thought, lot of them thought Hitler was the Antichrist. Serious, that's what people, oh, he's got to be the Antichrist. Look what he's doing. Terrible. Holocaust. So he says, and to you are troubled, rest with us. Hey, rest, amen? You're saved? Rest. He says he promised, to, Christ promised to give you rest. That's what he did, isn't that right? When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the lost in the tribulation. Who shall be punished? He said, it's flaming fire, verse 8. Verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. They'll spend an eternity in hell. Look at Re uh, Revelation 1-7. We've mentioned this last week or the week before, and I'm done for tonight. I guess I didn't finish everything, but we came close. How about that? Behold, he cometh with clouds. Watch this. Every eye shall see him. That's not the rapture. And they shall, they also which pierced them, and all kindreds of earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. <laughs> mm, amen means so be it. Amen, so be it. Every eye will see him. Well, if you turn off the lights, we'd have a bunch of kids screaming in here. If you turn off the lights, everything's dark. Every eye will see him. And flaming fire? From heaven, coming from heaven, God's shutting the lights off. That's what he's going to do. Anyway, we've got to stop there. And uh, there may be a few more things to say about that verse 29. Otherwise, we'll go to verse 30. Let's pray. Father, thank you again. Thank you for the truth of the word of God. Thank you that we have a hope in you. We pray for those who are lost, Lord God, that are here or maybe watching, that God, you would touch their hearts, help them open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. Lord God, help them not to wait. Today is the day of salvation. Help them not to boast themselves of tomorrow, Lord God, because they don't know what a day may bring forth. God, we do pray, we do pray for our people in this world, Lord God, that they would turn to you, turn to Jesus Christ, realize he's the hope of this world, Lord God. And no political leader, Lord, everyone politically pales in comparison to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our King of kings and Lord of lords. So Father, again now, God, just bless as we take a few moments for prayer, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.